It's November 15, 2008. This is Maximize Utility. Today I want to talk about what I call monetary policy ironies. Now I'm not going to talk about the history of monetary policy or the models or the effects, but I'm going to talk about how certain big names in the history of monetary policy, like Milton Friedman and Alan Greenspan, how they had certain ideas and how those ideas turned out just the opposite. And before I can go ahead and give those ironies, I just got to give you the setting. Remember we have a macro economy and we contend that it's aggregate demand, even though some of us do, and that we can control aggregate demand, and we talk about doing it through fiscal policy, that's spending and taxation by the government, and through monetary policy. And monetary policy is, you could say, changing the money supply, but it's really changing certain interest rates. And we, over time, have kind of come to the conclusion that what we, the most important piece of that policy was monetary policy in the short run. That meaning that we could control the economy using monetary policy in what we call the short run, months or quarters or a year or two. So that's the setting. Now let's look at some ironies of monetary policy. The greatest irony about monetary policy concerns uh, that great monetary economist himself, Milton Friedman. Now if you know Milton Friedman, you probably remember him. he was an anti-government economist. He didn't believe that the government improved economic situations. And that's true. Throughout his life he said that the government uh, couldn't control the economy and that the government couldn't improve the economy, and he had uh, books and, and speeches and even TV shows trying to make that case. Yet, in the last few decades, we've done a lot of monetary policy with the intention of improving the economy. For example, under Alan Greenspan, we were always doing monetary policy to steer the economy. Where did we get that idea from? We got it from Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman proved, supposedly, that monetary policy had effects in the short run. And you might say, it was Milton Friedman and many, many other things, uh, you could fill this room with papers about the effects of monetary policy, but you really can't. The statistical evidence on the effects of monetary policy is pretty thin. We really rely on the opinions of people about certain episodes, and the episodes are usually hyperbolic, like the Great Depression and the episode under Paul Volcker. And nonetheless, if you look at why we do monetary policy and why we would back it, we would say, well, Milton Friedman said it worked. There are a number of ironies that relate to Alan Greenspan and his term and his legacy as chairman of the Fed. Uh, just to recap, Alan Greenspan became chairman of the Fed in 1987, and he would be chair through 2005. Uh, when he started, he was more of a business economist with uh, say a conservative bent. He had worked in the Ford and Nixon administrations, for example, and he was a standard inflation fighter. But then in the 1990s, he seemingly did a great, great job as a central banker, using all the tools. And he would, uh, on his retirement in 2005, he would be hailed as the greatest central banker of all time. But then, as you probably know, in 2006, 2007, into 2008, the economy and the financial system deteriorated rapidly, and a lot of it would be blamed on Alan Greenspan. So, uh, what are the ironies that I see? Well, one irony is kind of a light thing. Uh, he started a PhD when he was young, but then he, he dropped it. He started at Columbia, and then he picked it up again, uh, maybe uh, 20 years later, and he finished it at New York University. Now, there's some question about his dissertation, because when he became chairman of the Fed in 1987, he requested that the dissertation be taken away from uh, public scrutiny. And nobody's seen this dissertation, apparently. And the thing about it is that by hiding the dissertation, it's made some people suspicious that the dissertation was a completely poor job. But according to at least one source who's seen the dissertation, it's a reasonably good uh, piece of work. And it's not uncommon in the world of PhDs for somebody to take so many years off and then go finish a dissertation. There can be a, a patchwork of other papers. So the irony I see is that by hiding the paper, he actually made it into an issue. Uh, if I were Alan Greenspan, I would just PDF it and put it up on the web for all to see, because it seems like it was a pretty good piece. Uh, a second irony about Alan Greenspan relates to his general uh, performance during his term as Fed Chair. One of the great ironies of Alan Greenspan is that during his time as Fed Chairman, it might have seemed like an era of great economic crisis and great economic calamity, but my guess is that in the future, when people write the history of this time, they'll call it an age of prosperity and fortune. Everything was coming up roses. Now, during that time, the stock market crash in 1987, there was a recession in 1990, 1991. There was the S&L crisis in the 90s, the Mexican peso crisis in 94. There was the Asian crisis in 97, the Russian bond default in 98. Long-term capital management collapsed in 98. The year 2000 problem, of course. Stock market crash in 01, 9 -11. Uh, recession in 01 and uh, deflation in 02 and they look like a lot of problems they look like frequent problems but if you look at some of them they're a very small magnitude like the Mexican peso crisis long-term capital management that big hedge fund would eventually be bailed out for about two or three billion dollars 
contrast that with what is happening today in 2008, and you realize that this period wasn't an age of turbulence, as Alan Greenspan says in his autobiography, but an age of extreme prosperity and extreme fortune for the economy. Another irony about Fed policy during the time of Alan Greenspan concerns uh, Milton Friedman again. Now, if you remember, Milton Friedman one time said, don't let people use discretion in doing Fed policy. Let a uh, computer, for example, set a money supply equal to some level and leave it at that. But while Greenspan was Fed chairman, he did a lot of activist policy. He tried to change things. He tried to change rates and tried to get soft landings and so on. And Milton Friedman would say, he would endorse Greenspan, would say that Greenspan was doing a very, very good job. I really don't know what to make of it. It struck me that Milton Friedman was really saying that Greenspan wasn't doing a bad job. But anyway, it does strike me somewhat ironic that Milton Friedman endorsed Greenspan, even though Greenspan was a relatively activist Fed chairman. Let me get away from directly targeting Alan Greenspan for these ironies, and let me bring up a guy, Alan Blinder. Alan Blinder is a top macroeconomist out of Princeton University, and he was appointed to the uh, Fed board in 1994, and he would be vice chair of the Fed board from 1994 to 1996 under Greenspan. Now, Alan Blinder was a little more liberal, a little more activist, and apparently, at least according to the biography by Bob Woodward, Blinder and Greenspan didn't hit it off. Uh, Blinder wanted to do more liberal policies, and Greenspan said no, and Greenspan kind of dominated. And so Alan Blinder, someone came out a loser against Alan Greenspan during the mid-1990s. But now, wait about nine, ten years, and when Greenspan retires, Alan Blinder is out there leading the charge, saying that Alan Greenspan was the greatest central banker of all time. Now, at that time, it might have looked that way. Of course, a couple of years go by, and now in 2007 and 2008, we sit there and say that maybe Alan Greenspan wasn't doing much of anything, and if anything, maybe he was doing some things that weren't that smart. Now, if Alan Blinder had only waited a couple of years, he uh, could have been exonerated, but he spoke too soon. So I see Alan Blinder as being a two-time lose. It's kind of ironic to Alan Greenspan. Let's uh, try to make up some ironies about uh, Ben Bernanke. Now, Ben Bernanke became chairman of the Fed uh, officially on Feb 1, 2006. And he came in, he was really pretty much a rules guy. He believed the Fed should follow a kind of rule that everybody knows about and let private parties work around that. In particular, Ben Bernanke was an inflation targeter. Let the Fed target a certain uh, level of inflation and try to stick to that without doing all kinds of other actions. And also, Ben Bernanke was big on transparency. He would tell all. He would tell what that target was. Now, uh, a couple of years go by, and I'll admit he kind of got a bad draw, and the times have been tough. But now he's using every tool, as he says, in the box. It's really, in a sense, every trick in the box. The Fed is doing all kinds of things outside of uh, inflation targeting. We're investing directly in investment banks. We're literally buying out entire companies like Bear Stearns. And we're investing directly in corporations and commercial paper. We're not really telling exactly what we're doing with the, all the money in the Fed balance sheet. It's a dramatic reversal from what he started out saying he was going to do. Again, I'll admit that he's kind of come in at tough times, but nonetheless, it seems very ironic how it's turned out.